John Sawat would often start his meditation instructions by saying, put yourself in a good mood. Think of anything related to the Dharma that puts you in a good mood. Because you have to approach the meditation with a good-natured attitude. There's going to be work involved, and it's going to require persistence. And you can look at it as a long chore, or you can find some way to make it enjoyable. So it's not a matter of struggling, 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 all in hopes that something really good is going to turn out at the end. There is a struggle, there is effort, sometimes extreme effort. But if you do it in a good-natured way, one, it makes it a lot easier to do the effort. You're not wasting your energy on unnecessary stress, unnecessary strain on yourself. And you're also in a good position to gain insight. Insight comes from that ability to step back a little bit. The image in the canon is of a person st sitting who's watching someone lying down or someone who's standing watching somebody who's sitting. You have to pull back a little bit to watch things. And a lot of that ability to pull back is to step back and see your own foolishness. As you get totally wound up in a particular pursuit, in a particular idea, it's got to be this way, this has got to work. And it doesn't work, and it doesn't work, and it doesn't work, and you're banging your head against the wall. Part of you has to step back and laugh in a very good natured way at yourself. Say, look at what you're doing. Listen to yourself. Watch yourself. And that's what can save you. Sort of try to approach the practice in a good natured way, with this ability to step back. There's the old Greek saying. The ancient Greeks said it's the gods who laugh. Human beings struggle around, and the gods who are sitting up there on Mount Olympus, and because they're a little bit disengaged, they can look down and see what's happening and have a sense of humor about the whole thing. It may sound cruel when one person is laughing at somebody else that way, but when you're able to laugh at yourself, that's the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of discernment. So what we're trying to do here is to get the path on the, our path of practice on the right path. Some people have problems with the idea of a right path versus a wrong path. But as the Buddha said, you know, if you're trying to make sesame oil, you don't crush gravel. You crush sesame seeds. There's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And John Fu, I'd like to point out two implications of the word samma in, in the right path. One is that it's consistent. You stick with it over time. And the other is that it's just right. Not just right, not only right, but just right. Your concentration is just right. The amount of effort you put into it is just right. And how are you going to know what's just right? Well, you have to experiment. You have to learn how to listen both to your body and to your mind to see what the warning signals are for when you've gone on too off far off to the left, too far off to the right. And again, that takes that good nature attitude that can step back a bit and just listen. Come to a conclusion, test the conclusion. And if it wasn't right, well, listen some more. Experiment some more. And John Lee talks about the factor of alertness in the practice. He compares it to a rope over a pulley. Sometimes you pull it one direction, sometimes you pull it the other direction. His meaning is that sometimes you focus most of your attention on the breath, and sometimes you focus more of your attention on the mind. For example, when you're working with the breath, if you find it intriguing, if you find it interesting, and it's enjoyable to work with the breath, go ahead and do it. But sometimes you find that it starts getting frustrated. You want to make it better and better and better, and it doesn't seem to be getting better. Well, that's a sign that you're, you've got to turn around and look at the mind. Why is the mind so upset about this? After all, it's just breath. And any old breath is going to keep you alive. And learn to be satisfied with what you've got. So this seems to be as far as it can go right now. Okay, be willing to settle down, and you're not the princess with a pea. You're just here to 
get involved in the present moment in a way that's pleasurable. Because the factor of pleasure is what allows the mind to stay concentrated, to stay happy here in the present moment. And if your efforts to adjust things, to make things just right, make them just perfect, goes out of bounds, well, you've, you've missed the purpose of the whole exercise. So you back up a bit. Stay with the breath for a while. And then sometimes as you stay with the breath, you begin to sense things you didn't sense before. And you can make a little more adjustment again. It's entirely up to you. You're not doing this to please anyone else or to measure up to somebody else's standard. You're here to make the breath as comfortable a place as you can right now. So it's good enough to settle down. And it's up to you to decide what's good enough for settling down. Important thing, once you settle down, then you stay there for a while. Try to let your awareness spread. Even if you can't spread the comfort of the breath, let your awareness spread around the body. So you have a sense of the whole body as you breathe in, the whole body as you breathe out. That's what's important. Because sometimes the best way to make the breath more comfortable is simply to watch it continually. It's like the quality control person in a factory. The cloth is running past that they're supposed to watch, and if they move their eyes away from it even for a second, they, they can very easily miss some problems in the cloth. So they have to keep a steady gaze on the cloth, and that way they're able to check whatever is wrong, simply by the steadiness of their gaze. So sometimes, sometimes as you want, making the breath more comfortable simply a, a function of how steadily you watch the breath without your having to think about it, making it longer, making it shorter, simply being steady with it, it becomes almost automatic. The breath begins to adjust. And that way you move to the next stage where you don't have to think about evaluating the breath or bringing your mind to breath, because it's right there. You're there with it. And the quality of the mind, which used to seem like music, which had a phrase and then would stop, and then another phrase and stop. In other words, you'd be with the breath for a while and then sort of blur your awareness a bit, and then come back and be more clearly with the breath, and then your awareness would blur out a bit, and then, which would come in like, like phrases, as I said. The phrases stop, and it just gets one continuous long ride down the breath through time. This is where the mind becomes really one, and you didn't have to think about when you were going to stop evaluating the breath. It just seemed like the right thing to do. This comes from learning to listen both to the body and to the mind. That pulley that, that John Lee talks about is checking the mind, checking the body. And because they're right here together, it doesn't mean you have to swing way back, back and forth. The breath is right here, the mind is right here. Try to have that sense of the observer that can watch these things. And do what you can to keep that observer in a good mood. Sometimes when it starts getting dry, the Buddha says, Okay, drop the topic and start thinking about something that inspires you. It might be the Buddha, it might be the Dharma, the Sangha. The good that you've done, either in terms of your generosity or in terms of your, your virtue. And when the mind, the dryness goes away, or the, the antsiness in the mind goes away, then you can bring it back to the breath. Remember, you've got to have a number of tools at hand. It's like dealing with a child. You read about people who try to develop scientific ways of raising their children, and the children come out all screwed up. But if you raise the child with lots of different methods, and John Lee talks about this again. Sometimes when the child cries, the best thing to do is to pick it up and pat it on the back. Sometimes you got to check it out and make sure it's not sick. Sometimes you give it something to, to eat, or just take it outside, take it for a walk. And over time, you begin to get a sense, if you listen to your child, you get a sense of when it's crying exactly what needs to be done. It's times you have to be strict with it. But the mind is like a child, and it's not going to respond just to one technique over and over and over again. It's, it requires you to check things, experiment. Find out precisely what's needed right now and provide it. And continue to do it in a good-natured way. 
That's one of the skills that we seem to lack most here in the West. We have all sorts of conveniences so that things get done fast, fast, fast. And we've never learned how to commit ourselves to something that's going to take a long time. It may not be easy, requires a lot of work, but learning how to talk ourselves into doing with a sense of pleasure, with a sense of good humor. John Lee talks about working with the breath. He says it's like walking on a long journey. You have somebody to talk to all along the way. In other words, you work with the breath here, you work with the breath there. And as long as you do it in a friendly way, it's, it's enjoyable. You can stick with it. As he says, long journeys seem shorter that way. But if you're constantly fighting along the, during the journey, then it, then it becomes the other way around. A short journey seems long. Or if you're insisting that your travel companions be perfect, you're going to have trouble finding travel companions. And you yourself are going to get miserable. So if the breath is good enough, okay, good enough will get you there. This is all a factor of discernment. Keeping the path on that just right mode. So that your concentration is just right, your mindfulness is just right. Feels good, feels okay. And of course it's gonna slip off to the left and slip off to the right, but if you maintain your good your good humor, you can catch it. Because you're listening, you're watching. And you're willing to learn from your mistakes. So try to develop this factor of alertness as much as possible. Because as John Lee says, alertness, when it gets strong, is what turns into the, the vision of knowledge and vision. Knowledge and vision of what is the, uh, eventually the knowledge of vision that releases the mind. It doesn't magically drop out of the sky. It's simply a, a fact. this factor of alertness developed, because you stick with it. And you stick with it because you're able to do it in a good-natured way. <laughs>